Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Right. I need to put start in the chat. So. Oh, uh, oh well done, Abdu. That's fabulous. Um, okay. So yes, chapter one, probability and counting. Uh, looking at some of the later chapters, this is a really great chapter because it's quite easy compared with some of the later ones. Um, so that's all. It's also good. Uh, and I haven't put anything too complicated in this because I don't want to scare people away on the first week, basically. Uh, OK, so. Right. If we start off, why should we study probability? Uh, if we, Yeah. And if we start at the beginning, what is probability and how they defined it is quantifying uncertainty and randomness in a principled way. So you could call it luck. You could call it chance. Uh, but this is kind of like taking that and taking it to a, a, a higher level, basically. Um, and studying probability is crucial as it equips us with tools to make informed decisions in uncertain situations. Um, so a lot of all this new data science kind of stuff, uh, particularly in more applied fields, that's all about making uh, those kind of decisions. Uh, understanding and predicting natural pheno uh, phenomena. So, for instance, if you are um, thinking how high to build a seawall because you want to uh, stop a one in every hundred year flood coming in uh, to uh, stop it from uh, flooding your town, you've got to understand probability because you've got to work out how likely it is. Uh, so that's uh, going on to the third one, that assessing risk in various fields, uh, any kind of um, thing where there's a risk, you've got to understand probability. And it's also really good in fostering critical thinking skills, because if you understand probability, uh, a lot of debate, particularly public debate, it's it's uh, after the advent of social media, it's it's very black and white. It's very one side against the other. If you think about that, things probabilistically, you'll see, well, some things may be right, but it's not 100% certain. It may kind of be 80, 90%, or it may be 20, 30%. Um, so it just gives a, a more nuanced view about things. So this empowers us to navigate the uncertainties of, of life and science effectively. Uh, probability, as, you'll, as you'll find out uh, with the rest of the book, probability is not easy. That's why it can be valuable. Basically, it is it is it is a skill um, and it can be learned. And I think it's a good skill to have. Uh, right. And you've got uh, applications in a whole uh, range of things. So statistics is basically uh, an applied version of probability. Uh, anyone who's done an opinion poll uh, or anything like that um, or something on that is basically probability. Uh, physics. Uh, the uh, I should have put this down in there. Uh, where, where they have the uh, atoms in 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 the same place, uh, in two different locations, uh, you know, they need a probability for that. Uh, in biology, uh, genes uh, is is something that they've used probability for. In computer science, algorithms. The stuff that's now ruling our lives and deciding what we see and all of that kind of stuff that's all based on probability meteorology uh if you go and check a weather forecast i know when i check my local weather forecast it'll give you a percentage of how likely it is to rain and sometimes that percentage may even be accurate uh, sometimes it's not though um right okay and then you've got even more applications gambling is uh you, you'll find a lot of uh things in probability were uh, discovered in 1700 and something uh, because people were trying to find better ways to gamble. Uh, in, in finance, uh, basically, it's the same as gambling. Uh, political science, yeah, you, you, you've got uh, opinion polls. Uh, also, since the, the 1960s, uh, they've actually used Bayesian probability techniques to uh, decide when US networks call states in, pre uh, in presidential elections. Uh, in medicine, 
it's actually really useful in medicine because uh, if you have a uh, a test, a positive test, they uh, it, it's actually interesting. If you've got a positive test, it doesn't mean a hundred percent that you've got whatever is detected because the tests aren't always right, uh, basically. Um, so it's good to understand uh, how likely it is that you've got a condition or not got a condition. And yeah, basically you can apply it to most things in life. Uh, and it's a, it's a good way to, to, to think about the uh, life in the universe. And one of the things that I like about this book particularly, because you get a lot of books about probability and they'll start off with coin tosses and dice uh, is, is the standard way that they uh, do it. But this one's slightly different and it talks about a uh, pebble world. Uh, and I don't know whether, uh, if, you have, if you haven't read it uh, all entirely, have a, have a bit of a look at it now. It's got nice pictures, it's good. <laughs> um, so one of the things that they've got in there is a union between A and B. So a union is where you have the probability of A and the probability of B, and the union basically covers both the probability of A and B. Uh, then it's got intersections. So if you've got A and B, and the intersection of A and B is the area, or in, in, the, in this case, the one pebble, which is covered by A and B, it is the double shaded uh, parts of the Venn diagram. It's where the Venn diagram overlaps. And then you've got complements. So, for instance, if you've got probability of A, the complement of the probability of A is not A. So, uh, if A is 40% uh, likely, the complement of A is whatever the other 60% is. That's the not A. Uh, so, the probability has between uh, uh, 0 and 1. And so, if you have, if A is 40%, uh, the complement of A is going to be 60. Uh, and this brings us to the naive definition of probability. And this is what most people will understand as the definition of probability. So uh, that's the naive definition of probability views it as a ratio of favourable outcomes to the total possible outcomes in an equally likely scenario. Uh, this is dice world, not real world. So this is the classic dice example. So the probability of rolling a one when you roll a dice is one in six. Uh, but it could be equally likely that it could be any other number uh, between one and six. Uh, the other assumptions are that you have independent events. So if you roll the dice once, you, uh, you get a number that won't affect what number comes up on the next um, roll of the dice. You have finite and countable sample spaces. You can listen, you, so you can list all of the outcomes on there, which isn't the case later on. Uh, you also have mutually exclusive events. So to go back to Dice World, you can't have a three and a five. You can have a three or a five, but not a three and a five. You will also get consistency towards a long run average. So for instance, if you are um, flipping a coin, uh, you might get four heads in a row, but if you uh, flip a coin 500,000 times, it's going to converge to roughly 50%. Uh, okay. So, and yeah, if you go on a bit uh, further, how to count. So, uh, this is uh, the multiplication rule, it is the biggest thing in there. Uh, I don't know, yes. Yeah, whether you, I think you've used R a bit before, uh, but yeah, this is the first time we're using R in this. So if you define probability A as 80%, probability of B as 12%, what's the probability of A and B occurring? So both of them, uh, basically you times the 80% by the 12% uh, and you get 9.6. Uh, so it's quite easy to do in R. Uh, right okay and then you've got uh sampling so sampling with replacement uh is a method 
in statistics where after selecting an item from a population, it is put back before the next selection. This means an item can be chosen multiple times, allowing for the possibility of duplicates in the sample. It's commonly used in simulations of random experiments. Or for instance, to, to put it in colloquial terms, if you take a any card out of a pack of cards at random, you put the card back the next time you choose it. So you can pick it again. It's not that likely, but you can pick it again. Uh, you also need to understand something without replacement. So uh, that's a statistical technique where each item is selected from populations not returned to next section. Uh, as a result, the sample does not contain duplicates, ensuring each item can be only chosen once. This method is commonly used in surveys and studies aiming to represent the population. Uh, I think it's got about stuff there about in section 1.4.8. Um, yeah. Another thing that we have to be aware of is adjusting for overcounting. So uh, this is in section 1.4.13. And it gives the example there of uh, selecting, you've got four people and you need to select a two person committee. So there are uh, six possibilities that you can uh, you know, if you have four people, you've got to choose two. There are basically six choices. So if your first choice, you've got four available, and then you've got three available uh, for your second choice, you think that you end up with 12, but you don't actually, because uh, what that means is that you count person one and person two, uh, and person two and person one as two separate things. Uh, so basically to avoid that, what you do is just divide by two. So in this example, you would do four times three uh, to give you 12 and then divide by two, which gives you six, which is the correct number of choices that you should have if you wanted to get a group of uh, a committee of two people out of a group of four. Uh, right. Uh, and then there's the binomial coefficient. Uh, so you'll hear a lot of n choose k. Uh, it's a great formula to put real numbers into, as long as they are small, as a fact, factorials get big quickly. Uh, so don't pick like 30, choose 28, because if you're, if you're calculate, calculating that by hand, it'll take you a while. Um, k has to be less or equal to n. Uh, R has a handy function for this. It's really easy. So for instance, uh, choose uh, two from five. There are 10 possibilities there. Uh, you can use the binomial coefficient to calculate probabilities for many problems where the naive definition applies. Uh, but yeah, that's quite useful. Uh, story proofs. Uh, I didn't get on massively well when I was reading story proofs. I still haven't quite come to terms with it. Uh, so I put on here, what on earth is a story proof? And a story proof is a proof by interpretation. Uh, that's what it says on there. Uh, but I wanted a further definition. So I asked uh, Chat GPT to come up with it and say it to me like oh, I was five. Uh, and it came up with story proofs use fun stories or games to show why mass things are true. It's like playing with toys while learning. The stories help us understand and believe in the math. Yay for stories and math. So I quite like that. That kind of helped me understand that a bit more. Sorry, uh, but how can we? How can we? How can we prove that ChatGPT is right? <laughs> well, just yeah, that's, a, just that, honest, that's a bit. That's a bit. <laughs> that, that's a bit my view, really. Um, it's. <laughs> I think it's it's more to help understanding rather than proof, really, because there there will always be um, uh, academics who will want to do do it like a do full mathematical proof, whatever. Uh, but when you're learning. I think a story proof can be useful, basically, because it's probably easier to remember. Um, I, th I think it's probably the, the, the right way to look at it. Uh, right. OK, so, yeah, if you've gone to the non-naive defini definition of probability. Um, so this is in 1.6.1 .1, and the general definition of probability, a probability space consists of a sample space and a probability function, which takes an event A as a subset of the sample space S as input and returns probability of A, a real number between zero and one as output. Um, 
Yeah, it's getting a bit heavy, isn't it? But that's what it says. Uh, so, yeah, non naive definition of probability, it gives a rigorous mathematical framework for calculating probabilities. In Pebble World, the definition says that the probability behaves like mass. So this is different from the naive definition. The naive definition was dice world. So uh, you, you had six options and they were all equally likely. Uh, the non-naive definition is you can have however many uh, outcomes as you want um, and they don't have to be equally likely. So the mass of an empty pile of pebbles is zero and the total mass of all pebbles is one because the probability has got to be between zero and one. Um, Pebbles can be any mass between zero and one, and the number of pebbles can be infinite. So you can have any number you want. Generally, you'll know what the number is, but not necessarily. Um, this is much more flexible than the naive definition and applicable to the real world. Uh, right, okay. So uh, property, properties probability, uh, the complement of A equals one minus the probability of A. Uh, they have a lot of uh, questions uh, in the book. Uh, I don't know if it's like 600 in, in, in the entirety of the book, which is a lot to go through um, and a lot of problem solving in there. One of the ways, if you don't know, that it's asking you what the probability of something is and you don't know what that probability is, one of the ways um, that they suggest of, of finding that probability is if you know the complement, uh, because you just go... Um, one minus uh, a is the is the complement, or if you have one minus the complement of a, then you can find a. Uh, also, if a is a subset of b, then the probability of a is going to be less than or equal to b. Uh, normally, if there's more than one thing in the set, it'll be less than. Um, but that's that's quite important to understand, and also. Uh, the union of A and B. So if you've got a probability of A and probability B, you've got to be aware that sometimes you can have A and B. So when you're working out the probability of the union, you can't simply add up A and B. It doesn't work like that. You've got to add up A plus B minus the intersection of A and B, because otherwise that would get that area that intersection, the the um, the extra shaded bit in the Venn diagram where it overlaps, that would be counted twice, and you don't want to do that. So A plus B minus the intersection. Okay. And Frequentist versus Bayesians. Uh, this will come up quite a bit in probability. Uh, if you've done logistic regression and stuff like that, um, then you will have been taught uh, a frequentist worldview, basically, which is pretty fine. It's pretty standard. Uh, frequentist view probability as an experiment conducted many, many times. They like to reject a null hypothesis when the probability is less than 0 0.05, that the null hypothesis is correct given the data. Um, and uh, yes, that's uh, quite famous on there. Um, Frequentist, basically, you, you, you've got you've got two worldviews there. You've got that frequentist view. You've also got the Bayesian view, which I'm probably slightly more um, amenable to. Um, and that's basically uh, Bayesian's view is probability in degrees of belief. So they assign greater probability of something the more evidence and data that support that conclusion. So they might have an idea of how something's going to work. Um, they collect more data. If, if that data shows that that thing is going to happen more likely, they would increase their view uh, of that actually happening. Um, so it's, it's based on the evidence and the data, uh, which I think is a good way to think about it. But it's, it's degree of belief. It, it doesn't tell you certainty uh, with absolute certainty with this like 5% cutoff, which the, uh, the frequentist um, uh, view is basically. Uh, Litsign and Huang argue that both perspectives are complementary. Uh, but they are the two main rival schools of thought in statistics. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to understand both kind of like sides of the argument, really. Uh, right. OK. So R, if you haven't used R before, this 
book is a great way to get started. The code in the book isn't difficult. Mostly it's only a line or two. Uh, let's look at the sample function. It's steady easy there. So uh, one to 100, pick five numbers. There you go. It'll pick the five numbers for you automatically. It's dead easy. Um, I'm not really a computer programmer. Um, I actually got into statistics uh, when I was at university. And I started off with SPSS and then I found R and it's kind of like, oh, I just moved over to it. It sort, it sort of feels like proper programming, uh, but it's actually quite easy and a lot easier than kind of like learning um, C++ or something like that. Uh, right. OK, if you want a sample with replacement where a number can be picked more than once, that's easy, too. So um, here we're sampling the numbers one to five, 25 times, and you've got to put replace equals true in there. If you don't do that, what happens is it just chucks an error because you, without replacing them, it can't pick 25 numbers out of the numbers one to five. Um, so that's why you need replace equals true. Uh, the information that you're putting into into the R functions are called arguments. So that's the one to five, the 25 and the replace equals true. They're, they're called arguments. Uh, a great way of finding out what arguments you can use is by putting a question mark in, in front of the function. Um, you, see, you can find out loads of stuff um, doing that. It's really quite useful. Uh, right. OK. And yeah, one of the examples that they have in the chapter uh, is the birthday problem. Uh, so it uh, lets you work, it helps you work out basically what's the probability of at least one birthday match in a class of 30. Uh, and it turns out it's quite high, uh, nearly 71%, 70.6% on there. Um, that looks kind of like quite complicated to code, uh, and it is. They've actually got an easier version uh, of it because I has been around a while. Uh, so if you want to know the probability um, the, for the birthday problem, you just put P birthday and then put the number in. Um, and that will give you the same figure, the 70.6. Uh, um, now, you can also uh, find out uh, how many people are required to get with a 1% chance of five birthday matches. So this, is, this isn't two people, this is five people all having the same birthday, but it's only a small chance. Uh, but if you've got 124 people, um, you can um, have a 1% chance that five of them will have the same birthday. Um, and you just use a Q birthday on there. Um, we may discover later on in for various other distributions. If you put P, P in front of the name of the distribution, you can get the percentage. And if you put Q, it will give you the number um, for various ones. So that's kind of like quite common to a number of uh, different uh, distributions in R. Uh, and they also do, there's also a bit about simulation in there. Uh, and this is actually, it's actually quite good fun. You get slightly different answers each time you try it, but it will generally be be um, quite close to where it should be. Because with the wonders of modern technology, you can do thousands and thousands, and thousands of, um, uh, you know, sample distribution, thousands, thousands, thousands of times. And it's, it's, it's quite uh, easy uh, to get some really great results with that. Uh, and also, one of the things I like about this book is it's really hard to understand. Uh, it is uh, a bit like Everest, okay? We are we are on the foothills of the Himalayas. We want to get to the top of Everest. We know it's not going to be easy, but they've handily given us uh, a guide to help with the route on there. So uh, if you're getting stuck uh, with it, um, they've got all... Uh, unfortunately, Jessica Hwang doesn't feature in the lectures, which is a shame, um, but Joseph Blitzstein... Um, is a professor at Harvard, and he has got his probability course all up on YouTube. So I think there's about 33 uh, YouTube videos on there. So if you're feeling a bit stuck, search out the video where he's, he's giving a presentation on it, and it will probably be quite useful to um, help understand it. It's the, this is another way to help uh, crack the problems. Uh, right. 
also other things that I found uh, that are useful. If don't just look at the formulas, uh, put real numbers, simple real numbers into the formulas, and and that will it gives it gives a uh, a good understanding. Um, and like I say, probability is not easy. So what I would say is keep going with it. Um, it's fine not to get it right first time. Leibniz uh, didn't, and he's a famous old dead polymath, right? Um, he has things named after him, and he got some stuff wrong in probability. So it, it's fine not to get everything completely right first time. Um, so yeah, cool. I think we'll um, sort of draw it to a, a, a close there. But yeah, it's a really good subject to study. Um, there's a lot of questions in there, but hopefully we can make some inroads in the future weeks. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Will, for uh, this wonderful presentation of the first chapter. Uh, quite uh, interesting, brief, but I think you touched on the main uh, main points uh, of the chapter. Though I haven't read the, the the whole chapter cover to cover, but I think you. I also looked at the 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 edX version of the of the of mm. the of the book, and I, I found it quite uh, summarized and easy to follow. Um, and they they usually give some motivation video at the beginning. I think if you're interested, you could check it out. So I was thinking, uh, is it necessary if we could discuss how we'll go about the the chapters? Is it yeah, uh, is sure. it that we should have yeah one session where we discuss the the theory and the the text? Then maybe the following session we try to work some of the problems. I, I don't know whether that makes sense or what do you think? Yeah, we could do that. I mean, it it would help us uh, get through. I think we would understand it more. Uh, I know yeah. in the, the the last one I did, we sort of glossed over the 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 the, the problem questions uh, for yeah. that one, but I think it would be useful to do it. Yeah, I was thinking like uh, the one who presents the like you present the chapter, you like uh, let's say before before next next uh, next session maybe during the by towards the end of the week you could say oh these are uh, the problems I want to discuss I will want us to discuss if you have time you could try to solve them so that the discussion will be more interesting and then we could just yeah. focus on those problems and and then it, it's just going to be like some selected problems because the, the problems are many but like I think walking through some selected problems i think that might be interesting yeah that'd be good how, how do you feel about that chelsea is that good um i like that idea but i like it better if it's part of the same week like i don't want to separate it out by weeks where it's like the concepts okay. one week and then the applied problems the following i think if we could dedicate maybe like the last 15 or maybe 20 minutes to the problems within the chapter presentation that'd be great but cause mostly because I want to get through it faster <laughs> okay um is that okay if, if we say say if we do half an hour on the presentation uh and then half an hour on uh the the questions and answers and stuff like that yeah that'd be great should be fine but, but I think some chapters might also be very long let's see yeah um Shall we, shall we look at that in individual chapters? Because I did have a look at the questions right. and they they do actually vary. Um, so, so some weeks have a lot of a lot of questions and some weeks they, they don't have so many uh, based mm -hmm. on the chapter. Um, next week, shall, shall we just do chapter two uh, and do the questions and do it in one week? Yeah, yeah, I think that should be fine. Yeah, we we just yeah. like select two, or three questions to discuss. You know, I think it should be fine. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, also because I I I see your point. When it gets longer, you know, some other things could pop, pop, pop in, and you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess we don't have to stick rigorously to like half an hour, half an hour. If there's some really important and confusing topics that just like require more discussion then yeah we can just kind of play it yeah. by ear depending on the chapter cool uh right do any of you do you want to do the presentation next week um i could probably do 
next week, but I was going to ask how, um, how did you put together this presentation? I've never done like a Quarko presentation before. I've only uh, ever, you know, I do like PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> uh it's not quarto um it's our markdown basically. okay well yeah yeah same, yeah. same yeah. thing so, basically but sorry, uh, I, I suggest you look at you look at the like the, the, the materials for the alpha ds the i think the you know in the in the book club they, they give some very good, good uh, guide on how to go about preparing your slides okay um, yeah. yeah, that's my only concern with presenting is not having done this type of of slides before. Um, uh, I'll, like I'll, I'll I'll find you a cheat sheet, basically. Um, That'd be great. All I've used in there is like uh, something to define uh, the title. Mm -hmm. uh, where something to put a dot in there, uh, which is basically just a hyphen, and. Uh, you do the slide a, breaks. Uh, the slide breaks does it, doesn't do that automatically. Because um, I've done like a I've done Quarto and our Markdown before, but it's just been like an interactive script type. I haven't actually yeah. you know converted it to like this slide format. Uh, it, it's it's the headlines. Uh, so okay. it's just hashtag hashtag. Then you put the headline, and that generates generates the break. I'm just looking at my script uh, on there. And really, the, the most complicated thing on there is, is getting the code in there. But it's li literally like six little dots. It's in the <laughs> left hand. Yeah. I'll, I'll message you with the, the details uh, on that. Okay. Yeah, but, a little uh, cheat sheet would be great. for. <laughs> yeah. Bas okay. Basically, I did try Quarto once. And I didn't get on with it because um, it was a bit complicated. Our markdown, I think it's just like it's it's easy. Even an idiot like me can do it, basically. Uh, so so that's what I've kind of <laughs> yeah. stuck with. It. Uh, someday I'm probably going to have to kind of like tackle quarter again, but I'm putting that off. Our markdown's fine for now. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, so I don't think we're going to worry too much about the questions in in week one. Um, I did have a look at some of them, but yeah, I'm certainly yeah. haven't looked at all of them. Sh yeah, shall I we concentrate? Like, I, I think once we are solving, if if we get have issues, we could always share it in the in the channel, and then we could try to maybe have. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm going to have a go at as many of the questions as I can get through for uh, chapter two next week. Um, so I, I, Chelsea, I don't want you to feel that you're going to get lumbered with the presentation and have to do all the questions as well. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask if, um, thinking about like how to go about doing it, did we want to just kind of discuss ahead of time problems that we'd like to go through together, or do we want to leave it up to the presenter to pick a few? Like if there's any ones that are particularly challenging that we all agreed to work through, that might be the most beneficial way to use our time, but it would require us like having all gotten through them by a certain yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is always I think, hard. I think, I think I think the presenter should like decide because you know. Okay. Yeah, I think the presenter should decide. So, in in if someone wants to suggest something, they could just put it in the chat, and then you okay. decide whether you you feel that you want to. Okay. Well, for, I think. for next week, I'll, for next week, I'll do my best to let you guys know at least a couple of days ahead of time yeah, what the yeah, problems yeah. that I'm thinking are, yeah. just so you can make sure you at least like take a look at them and see, um, give them a shot. So, I mean, basically, it, it's um, uh, a relatively short presentation uh, about uh, the chapter. Um, because one of the, one of the things that I think people fear about doing the presentation is, oh my god, it has to be an hour or something like that, because 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 this goes up to a maximum of an hour. It doesn't have to be an hour's presentation. Uh, you know, it's kind of like quarter of an hour, twenty minutes. It is it, fine as long as it covers the main details in the chapter. Some chapters are going to be more complicated than others. Um, that can be stretched out to half an hour, or whatever. Uh, but it's kind of like uh, after about thirty minutes. 
is kind of like death by PowerPoint. Whatever, whatever anyone does, um, people's listening span, particularly on Zoom, isn't infinite. So there's no need to kind of like do 60 pages of uh, 60 slides or whatever like that. that that's just like too much. Yeah. Enough, yeah. And also, we've got other things to do. We've got lives. We can't do this all the, you know, this isn't like a, our job. So um, this is what we do for fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, you don't have to do absolutely tons. No, no, no one gets told off for uh, not doing question X or Y or um, like that. We'll, we'll just do the best that we can. Yeah, oh, sure. I, I think that's it. Yeah, we just do the best we could. It's just to, to have fun like you. <laughs> yeah, like you mentioned. Cool. All right, then. Um, same time next week. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Cheers, Chelsea. Cheers, Abdul. Okay.